started with another kind of new one. His name is Wonderful on page 118. How many times do you want to sing it through, maybe? Two times through? It's just a chorus, so we'll sing it two times through. 118, his name is Wonderful. Thank you. 
come to you, thanking you for another beautiful morning to come to your house to worship you, and thank you for all the blessings that you have given us, and and ask that you continue to bless us. <coughs> but ask that you be with those who are sick and in the hospitals and just are are hurting, and give them the strength and comfort they need. And we'd ask that you be with those who were elected this this past week and help them lead in a way that will be pleasing unto you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our next hymn before the message is My Jesus, I Love Thee on page 79. We'll do verses 1 and 4. 2 times 3. 79. My Jesus, I Love Thee. Verses 1 and 4. Yeah, yeah. 
know what's been around. Now, see, before we do that, I want you to see. See all these people out here? They're happy. You're singing. They're smiling because they're thrilled that you're helping. Second verse. Oh, it's ready? <laughs> if you're happy and you know it, give the cool. So however that is. <laughs> if you're happy and you know it, give the cool. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show. If you're happy and you know it, give the cool. So if you're happy and you know it, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And you know it, do all three. Whee! <laughs> Praise the Lord! If you're happy and you know it, do all three. Whee! Praise the Lord! If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show. If you're happy and you know it, do all three. dismissed to head downstairs for lesson time. Go ahead and go that direction. All right, where in the world are we? Whee! Oh, I, I, I need to add that to a lot of more songs uh, that we sing on Sunday morning. Thank you for getting wrapped up. Too. Yo, you're welcome, Greg. There is some coffee down there, too. I think you can share with them a little bit if you didn't. The Bible doesn't tell us everything about people's lives as it relays the stories in the book of Genesis. I mean, wouldn't it be interesting to know what Adam thought when God showed him Eve? Wouldn't it be interesting to know what Noah said to his wife before getting her on a boat for an extended period of time? Wouldn't it be interesting to know how Abraham and Sarah met? You know, what kind of relationship and how did it develop and how did they fall in love? The good news is we don't get to know many of those stories. But here in the chapter 25 uh, of the book of Genesis, we get a glimpse in a love story between Isaac and Rebekah. So if you have your Bibles, I want to head that direction. Uh, Genesis chapter 25. It's an interesting chapter because the length of this chapter would show us literally, uh, literarily, I guess is the right word to use there, that this was an important one. There's this 67 verses in this chapter. There's a lot of details in this story. And so the writer of Genesis, Moses, as he gives us this story, he gives us these details to tell us a little bit about the importance of this story. Here we have Isaac the child of the promise, the child who had been waited for for hundreds of years, well, hundred for a long time, uh, choosing a wife, the progression, the next generation to the story, and that's why it comes together this way. Maybe an interesting uh, consideration as we get started here is, how did you get together with your spouse? Uh, with the people uh, that you love in your life. What story is there with that? It's uh, no coincidence, of course, the way that God works, uh, that we celebrated 28 years together uh, this week. I bought Penny Flowers because I missed a few other opportunities to do that and knew I needed uh, a few extra points. But 28 years ago on Tuesday, <laughs> uh, we went on our first date. Now, it wasn't the first time that we had met, because that was on my birthday, my golden birthday, when the Eagles were on Monday Night Football, and Dad was in the hospital. But there's a lot of other details that are part of that story that maybe uh, you can hear at some point uh, in some way. But an opportunity to celebrate the time of being together. How did you meet? Maybe it's a good story to tell your kids. Uh, have an opportunity when everybody gets together to relive those things. I, I remember Dad telling us a story about how and Mom, he and Mom met, uh, and there was a whole lot to do about 4-H camp. And then Dad makes a list about what he wanted with the certain girls who were part of his life, and he was going through the list, checking them off uh, to figure out which one was the right one uh, for him in that way. How did you meet? What importance does it play in the relationship that you're in? For Isaac and Rebecca. 
the interesting part of the story as we're going to read today is God intervenes in this story. Uh, did God have a hand in you getting together? Now don't blame him. <laughs> All right. But the good news that we want you to consider is God knew and he knows and he has a plan for your life. And so the consideration of who you are with, uh, your future is already written with him. And maybe you worry about that. Well, did God really have a play in who I ended up marrying and who my family is? The good news is, church, that God has you where he wants you and he's positioning you to grow in your faith. Some people may hear this story and ask the question, do you have the one? Here's what I want to tell you. If your spouse is the one that you have, then you have the one. Okay, real simply put that way. God loves marriage, and he ordained it as a very special institution, a very important covenant that people have to help make the, uh, not just make a stable society, but also to provide comfort and love for one another in that way. Consider that as we read this story, Genesis chapter 24, uh, verses 1. And we're going to read a big part of this story through verse 21 uh, here together. Genesis 24, the Bible says this, <coughs> Abraham was now old and well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the chief servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh, I want to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from among the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant asked him, What if the woman is unwilling to come back with me from this land? Shall I take your son back to the country you came from? Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household in my native land, and who spoke to me and promised me an oath, saying, To your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, so that you can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only don't take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. The servant took ten of his master's camels and left taking with him all kinds of good things from his master. And he set out from, for Aram Nehirim and made the way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels near down near the well outside of town. It was toward the evening, the time that women would go out to draw water. Then he prayed, O Lord God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside the spring, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, and she says, drink, I will water your camels too. Let her be the one that you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I'll know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before he had finished praying, Rebekah came out with her jar on her shoulder. She was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor. The god was very beautiful, a virgin. No man had ever lain with her. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up again. The servant hurried to meet her and said, Please give me a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered the jar to her hands and gave him a drink. After she had given him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for your camels too, until they finish drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran back to the well to draw more water, and drew enough for all of his camels. Without saying a word, the man watched her closely to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. What does it take to pick a wife? Uh, so the story is kind of interesting. Remember, Abraham is in a foreign land. God called him to leave his native home and to go to a new land that he was going to establish, the promised land. Abraham is there and finally has a child, and now his child needs a wife, but he makes a few decisions there, right? He says, don't get a wife from among the people that we live here. Go back and get a wife from the people who we're related to and bring her to me. Abraham was old. He wasn't going to make the travel. It's interesting, a few things that he says here, and we'll highlight them as we go. He sent the servant to go and didn't send Isaac to go along this journey. Uh, an interesting note to kind of point out that the servant was going to have to do the work and do the choosing and bring back this woman to be married to his son. And so as the story goes along, the servant gets there and then he, he gets ready to approach the visit and he realizes that he doesn't have a plan. <laughs> Uh-oh, what am I going to do? And so he comes up with the best plan he probably could have, which was what? To say a prayer. 
and in that prayer, he asked God to give him a sign. If I go to a woman and she offers me a drink, and then I turn and she then offers to, uh, to water my camels as well, that will be the one that I know is the one I should see. The way that the Bible tells the story, as soon as Rebecca comes out, it seems as if the servant's like, oh, I bet that's the one. And that's how he approaches her and starts the conversation in the first place. And sure enough, Rebecca takes care of him, offers to take care of his camels. He brings out some of the gifts that he has and starts a conversation about who she is and what his intentions are. They meet with the family, and the rest of the story is there in the rest of the part of the chapter. Uh, and they may begin making plans on taking Rebecca back to Abraham uh, and Isaac so that she then uh, can be married. Uh, an interesting story in the light of how God chooses who uh, the, this person has a chance to marry. And, and you can read through a lot of the details here. Uh, they pick a person who wants to not just take care of him, but also water the camels. We read earlier that he sent 10 camels uh, down with his servant there uh, on to be on this trip. Someone made note in, the, in my studies that uh, a camel can drink up to 30 gallons of water if they're thirsty. Uh, so if this woman took time to take care of his needs and then 300 gallons of water to haul around for, I mean, there was a commitment level that happened here. She wasn't just setting out uh, some uh, cookies that she had gotten from Walmart uh, to help make sure that everything was... There was a, she made the decision uh, and was very gracious in, in the effort that she made. She showed uh, a spirit of servanthood in that way. So, we get to this point. Oh, the 10 camel test, yeah. Uh, came across that, I thought it was interesting. What about you? Did God give you a sign? And sometimes we hear this story and we're like, uh-oh, I don't remember God giving me a sign and choosing the one. Don't stress it. Don't miss the main point. We'll get to the main point in a moment. But as we do that, I want to uh, make notice of a few points that Abraham tells his servant with this. If you have your Bible still open, uh, let's look at a couple of the things that Abraham tells his servant. The first thing that he tells his servant to do is there in verse 3. He says, Swear by the Lord God of heaven and earth that you will not get a wife for my son from among the daughters of the Canaanites in whom I'm living. We've got a problem. Time to choose a wife. And the dad looks to the people who are closest to him and is like, none of these girls are going to do. Interesting to note. Maybe you want to ask yourself, well, why? What is it about the Canaanites that made Abraham make such a statement like this where he would send his servant all the way back to the land where he was from to choose a wife? We are known, uh, the Canaanites are known historically uh, and from every evidence that has been found from them that to be very pagan people, horrible people, uh, worshipers of demons, very sexually perverse, very depraved people. You remember these are the same people that God is getting rid of from this land as Abraham and his descendants have a chance to take the land. There's a point there where Abraham starts uh, uh, growing and conquering, and God says, well, wait a minute, it's not time to get rid of the Canaanites. And then the story of Israel continues as they move down into Egypt where they grow into a huge population and become slaves there in Egypt. And 400 years later are taken out of Egypt and to brought to the Promised Land. And that's when Joshua begins conquering these evil people, the, the pagan Canaanites, for the way that they lived. Well, the way that they treated one another, the despicable things that they did. So this is a little precursor to all that. But Abraham was smart enough and wise enough to say, if we're going to pick a girl, it's not going to be one of these girls. <laughs> these girls are not suited to be for my son. Then he also says in verse 6, if you have your Bibles there, be sure not to take my son with you to pick out a wife. I find that to be a little bit interesting. Why in the world would he not send Isaac to be, okay, we need to meet somebody. We need to see who has the spark. We need to give you the opportunity uh, to connect and find out who it is that you want to fall in love with. But that's not Abraham's idea at all. Why is that not? Maybe you have to consider the way that he says it. He said, don't take my son uh, with you to go find a wife because that's not our land. That's not the promise that God has given to us. There's a chance that if Isaac goes back to find a wife, he'll be convinced to 
set up his place there in the old homeland, not in the promised land. And so he goes right back, and Abraham says, it's the promised land. This is the place that we're going to be. So Isaac is not going to leave this place. And we're not going to send him off where he can be distracted and he can change the plans. God has given us this area, so do not take Isaac with you in that way. A couple other things that he says is, you're not going to do this on your own. Verse 7. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of the, my father's household in my native land, and who spoke to me and promised on an oath, saying, To your offspring I will give you this land. He will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son from there. Abraham very wisely said, I'm not just sending you, servant, to go do this. God's going with you. Don't sweat it. How are you going to pick a needle out of a haystack? How are you going to pick one woman from a whole group, a whole society of people? God's going to be with you, and he's going to send his angel to guide you. That had to be reassuring, and that brought us along with the story. And then there's a little point there where the servant has a chance to respond, and he says, uh, well, wait a minute, I, there's only one problem, Abraham. Uh, you are this great and powerful man, and you've given me this task to go and pick this wife for your son. What if I get all the way over there and can't find anybody? And Abraham very wisely says, it's okay if you come back empty-handed. It's okay if you find somebody and they tell you no. You see, and when we put all of these stories together and the principles that Abraham gives his servant, God doesn't always do what we want. Uh, that would make us God. Instead, God uses his power to work on his plan. And sometimes we need to wait. And Abraham understood that finally. And so he gave his servant the reassurance, if all else fails, it's okay. God's got this taken care of. These are good principles for those who are preparing for marriage, but also for us to instill upon those who plan to marry, to share with the next generation. And for those of you who are already stuck uh, with your spouses, uh, just kidding. Uh, there are still a few principles that I think that you need to hear from this love story of Isaac and Rebecca. The first is very obvious. Meet and marry a Christian. One of the other reasons that church is important is because this is a place, these are the people that you find to spend your life with. It's important that you believe and learn to believe with someone that you can fall in love with because you can either be nurtured by your spouse spouse and their faith or you, it can destroy you as you believe two different things. A Christian and a non-Christian believe different ideas. Yes, it's important that we marry people that we uh, love and that we're connected with. And if we're already in those situations, let the gospel teach them and share with them. But be careful about uniting yourself, becoming one with one who is fundamentally opposed to you. Do they serve God? Do they believe God? Do they honor God as Lord? If they don't, and you do, and your children do as they're choosing spouses, you've got a problem. Abraham knows that, and that's why he gives us directive. One of the things that I pray for my kids very often, uh, every day, every week, is that they will be blessed by having a believing family, a believing spouse, with believing kids. Those things are what's important. That's what helps hold a, a family together. That's what gives them love in that way. Important, uh, what Abraham knew that he shared with them. The second thing that he says is, don't neglect God's promises once you found someone, Abraham knew the promise of God. God said he was going to give him, make him a nation, give him a land, and bless him. And Abraham, at this point in his life, wasn't willing to let go of those promises. And so I think the principle stands with us as well. Know what God has given you. Feed on the promises that he has given to you. Don't neglect the truth of salvation. Uh, don't misunderstand the brevity of life on this earth. Don't forget the eternalness uh, of eternity. God's promise provides hope for this life. That's why we have a chance to read the scripture. That's why we have a chance to worship him. Because he has given us such great promises. But sometimes when we get into relationship, we want to discard the promises of God and, be, and lose focus on the things that are really important in life. Abraham here said, no, 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 no. The promise is what's important promise of what God has done and will do for you is what is important. Hold on to it. The person that you marry is still not number one in your life. 
God should be. That person should be number two. And a distant number three for following that. But still, God needs to still be number one. The promise that he gives to you is still so real. He is the one who provides your eternal salvation, not your spouse. He is the one who provides hope for your future, not the people that we love around us every day. Don't neglect God's promises once you find someone. And pray for your spouse. It's the second most important decision that you'll ever make in your life. Who are you are going to find for to have companionship with? Who you are going to give your heart to? Who you are going to make people with? It matters, so pray for that person. And don't just pray for your spouse before God blesses you with one, but double down and pray for them after they said yes. Support your spouse. Love your spouse. Praying for them specifically establishes both support and love in that way. Let's revisit the story a little bit. I think it's interesting. The servant, as we've made note of, gets his camel caravan together, makes this journey to go and find the wife, and he comes to a place and he realizes, what am I going to do? The good news is, his master said, if it doesn't work, you're all right. You know, I'll forgive you for that. And so he goes to the town square and he's like, okay, I'm in trouble. How am I going to do this? And then he stops and he prays. It's a little interesting to see that he didn't pray before he got everything packed uh, in the car. Uh, he didn't pray before he made a checklist of everything that he would need on this 600-mile journey. And sometimes, maybe it's not as surprising, because sometimes we live the same way, right? That prayer becomes the afterthought. I know what I'm supposed to do. Okay, I'm going to go do it. Oh, I forgot to pray. <laughs> oh, I didn't involve God at this point in my life. I better stop. I better know what to do. i got to come to refocus myself and take some time to just pray. And sometimes that happens in every part of our life. But look what it says there in Scripture of the way that he says it. Uh, in verse, uh, I think it's there in verse 12 uh, and following. Then he prayed. What does he pray? Oh, Lord. God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. It's as if the servant may not have the same relationship with God that Abraham does, but he's seen his master pray. Remember all the times that we've talked about throughout the weeks of Abraham stopping to worship and the difference that it makes when Abraham shows other people his worship of God, uh, the effort that he takes to worship God so that other people then can be connected to God and see the importance of it. That was even in the story last week with what he did with his son Isaac and taking him uh, up there on the mountain. And here it pays off because the servant saw that Abraham was a prayer <coughs> and prays in some ways like, okay, God, I'm not really good at this, but I know that you love Abraham, and, and I know that Abraham prays to you, so please help me out in this way. And as he prays, he lays out the fleece in front uh, of the Lord, and God provides it in that way. The story of Isaac and Rebekah have several relational principles, but think about it. The one thing that I want you to understand about this story is very simple. <coughs> Do marriage and family God's way. That's the point of this chapter, I believe. Uh, don't do life God's way. When it comes to doing things in life, sometimes we do life and then we stop and we worship God. And then we go back to do life. But what we hear from the story is that we need to do life God's way. We need to ask God to be a part of the decisions that we make in our life. We need to depend upon God to help show us the direction of the things to do in life. We need to be reading God's word. We need to be connected to his spirit in obedience. Too often our lives comes about the doing things our way instead of God's way. God has a way to raise a family. God has a way to be married. God has a way to decide what's important in life. God has a way to decide about your entertainment. God has a way to decide about where your money goes. God has a way to decide about every part of your life, but so many times we'll push God aside and bring him out only when we get ourselves in trouble. This story reminds us it's an important decision that Isaac has, to, that Abraham has in choosing a wife for his son, and he involves God in it all the way through. I think that's a good reminder. So, so many times we try to do things our own way, and when we do, they fail. Isaiah the prophet reminds us 
uh, as he writes about the Lord, he says, My thoughts are not like your thoughts. Your ways are not like my ways. Just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. As a culture, as a people, sometimes we think we have everything figured out. If we just dumb it down, if we just rationalize it a little bit, then we can make it uh, to fit our life. We can take God's word and, and, and make it fit to our desires and the way that we want to live and the way that we choose to live. And that's the cultural world uh, that we face as, as Christians uh, every day. But the simple reminder is, don't do things your way. Do things God's way. The example is there of the servant. The servant agrees with Abraham on what to do. They make a covenant. The servant follows the direction that Abraham gives him. The servant prepares uh, for this journey uh, and doing what he needs to do. The servant prays, and then after he prays, the servant follows the door that God opens. And even there in verse 52, after all of this happens, he makes a connection. He has a chance to meet with the family. What does it say that the servant does? Verse 52, when Abraham's servant heard, heard what the family said, he bowed down to the ground before the Lord. Here we have it again, that W word. He worshipped. Because Abraham worshipped, he taught the servant how to worship. And as God revealed himself, here the servant, after being obedient in all of these steps, he worships the Lord. And that's not the last time it make, makes reference here. We'll find it here at the very end of the chapter at that. We need to live God's way. We need to obey the scripture. We need to repent of our sin. We need to walk in in faith. If you have your Bible still open, let's read the last few verses uh, of this chapter. So they picked up Rebecca, and she gets on the camel, and she rides back uh, into the promised land uh, to be with Isaac, and what happens? Verse 62. Now Isaac had been, had come from Beer Lahai Roy, for he was living in the Negev. He went out to the field one evening to meditate. As he looked up, he saw camels approaching. Rebecca also looked up and saw Isaac. She got down from her camel and asked the servant, Who is the man in the field coming to meet us? He is my master, the servant answered. So she took her veil and covered herself. Then the servant told Isaac all that he had done. Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother Sarah, and he married Rebekah. And so she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. It's a love story. It's a connection that God makes as he gets involved in our life. As he is allowed is given opportunity to be involved in our life. The amazing thing about God is he gives us so many choices every day to make. And the choices we make are usually the simple choice of, are we going to do it our way or are we going to do it God's way? Am I going to push God out of the way and believe that in my pride I have the opportunity to make my best decisions or does God have the best way with it? The good news is that God is a loving God. God loves your marriage, and God loves your family. But the thing that I think that we can remember from this story more than anything else is that God loves you, and he provides for you again and again, even in our failures. That's the story of Jesus. It's not just a love story between a man and a woman, but it's a love story between the creator of the universe and you, what all he has done. If we do things his way in providing for us his hope and all that. Come back to where we started. How did you all meet up? Penny tells me there was a list in our life, too. <laughs> On that list was something about uh, not losing your hair. So I guess I'm still good uh, when it came to that. And something about being able to carry a tune. So I'm sorry if I have to lead singing every now and again, uh, just to help prove that point in that way. But she also wanted a person who was a Christian, someone who knew the Lord. And she prayed for it good news is, as we give those things to God, he gives his blessing and his grace back to us. God blesses us through Jesus. And what Isaac did after he was there oh, and, met, uh, and met his wife, he stops what he's doing and he goes out and he worships as well. He's out in the field to worship the Lord and we're reminded that that's what we can do. As God opens up those opportunities in our life, as God opens up those doors, as God reminds us about those promises, how do we respond? Sometimes we barely open the door into our heart, right? 
God, I'll give you a little bit on Sunday morning, or I'm really struggling with being sick. God, I need your help. Let me just crack the door a little bit open and throw a little bit of your blessings in here at me, if you will, in some way or another. This story reminds us that, no, let God in. Do life God's way and return and respond in worship. A marriage made in heaven, that's the story of Isaac and Rebekah. Isaac was the promised child. And through Isaac, through Abraham, through the promise of God, we find the blessing that we know today in the person of Jesus. The opportunity for God to continue to be involved in our life and show us the right way to live. How do you need to respond to the Lord today? We come to the time in our service to sing the decision song. Uh, to consider, okay, God, you've laid this stuff out before me. I know sometimes I don't always rely on you. I know sometimes I'm not always the best prayer. I know sometimes I have so many things that I want to hold on and believe that I can handle on my own. But we're reminded through Scripture that we need to let those things go and honor and worship the Lord. Our hymn of decision is number 655. And if you need to respond to the Lord today, we ask you to come forward. We have a chance to pray with you. Uh, and sometimes maybe you feel awkward enough that you don't want to step out in front and come down the aisle. My number is there in the bulletin. Uh, I know I say this every now and again. I would love to be able to sit down and talk to you about the things that you're facing in life, to be able to pray with you and let you know that you don't have to do life by yourself. We're talking about marriage. We're talking about relationships. It's not easy. Life is hard. There are all kinds of obstacles. And just as God provides, the enemy throws things in our way to make us stumble, to make us fail. So we need the support that we can find in one another. If we can help support you, let us be able to do that and reach out as we grow together as a church. Hymn and Decision, number 655, Sanctuary. Let's sing it through once, uh, and then have a word of prayer. Please stand. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Thank you for the opportunity to know love, not just from uh, our family and those close to us, but to be reminded of the way that you love us through Jesus. And Lord, help us to respond to that great, amazing, eternal love. Help us, Lord, to see uh, and appreciate uh, and be able to tell you uh, the, how great it is that you want to be involved in our life for opening the door through the person of Jesus. Lord, help us to love you back. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Be seated. We'll continue on then with our worship time with They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love. 429. Let's do one, two, and four.
that. So I do have a fellow stepping in to preach for me, Adam Smith. He's been here once before, a young man from the community. Uh, he's going to come and share with you all next week. Uh, and thank you for those of you who donated to our Christmas Star program. Uh, today was the last Sunday. If you happen to still have something that you haven't <coughs> dropped off yet, please contact me or Julie or Thompson or somebody uh, or Alicia and we'll get that connection made to get it packed up and sent off. But thank you for all the efforts that you've taken to help the people here in the community. We appreciate that greatly. Uh, and we uh, think that's the only thing. So any other announcements you need to make? Let's stand and close with one prayer, please. Father God, the day is wonderful because we know that you're in it. Same with our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you intervene, that you involve us, that you take sometimes a messy life and, and make it beautiful. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the way that your spirit works within us, the way that it gives direction and guides us and shows us your truth. Uh, and Lord, we thank you so much for the provision that you give us just to know you through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for giving us reason to worship. May worship be on our hearts today and this week as we go about our daily lives. We pray, Lord, for our families. We pray, Lord, for those who are not able to be with us this morning. Uh, thank you for the blessing of knowing them uh, and loving them as well. Help us, Lord, to stand as your church in truth. Uh, help, Lord, uh, those who uh, represent you all throughout this world today uh, be reminded of your great love and the peace that comes from knowing that you are king. In the name of Jesus, we pray.